I'm Chris Jones, uh, and uh, I'm here to introduce a talk tonight uh, about farming and uh, a subject very dear to my heart, climate change, and another subject very dear to my heart, beavers, and uh, how uh, we think beavers can help us as farmers uh, across a great swathe of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, reason I can't move my slides. <laughs> yes. So Chris, make sure you go to your the tab with your slides on them and you can just click in the center of the page. Okay, is that working? Yes. Okay, great. Right. Um, so uh, on our little panel here this evening, uh, we've got three great uh, speakers. First one, Lucy, Lucy Isaacson. Uh, she is uh, going to give us some input on um, climate change going forward and uh, what our weather uh, is expected to look like over the next 20, 30, 50, 60 years. Um, she works for Climate Vision Cornwall and she wrote the 10 pledges uh, about 10 years ago now, which are a fabulous way uh, for an individual uh, or family to uh, actually decarbonize themselves. And she was also the instigator and uh, first chair of the Cornwall Community Flood Forum. We've got George Young, um, a, a very smart up and coming young regenerative farmer from Essex. And he's doing a great deal right now to make his farm a lot more climate resilient. And finally, to tell us about the, the uh, beavers, all the way from California State University of the Channel Islands, we have Emily Fairfax. Uh, who is uh, a geological scientist and has spent a number of years now studying beavers and their environmental impacts. Um, finally, me. Uh, I'm a PFLA member, host of Cornwall Beaver Project and a director of Beaver Trust. And if I may just indulge myself slightly, um, I was at the very first Oxford Real Farming Conference in a little room above a cafe in 2010. Uh, in a snowstorm, uh, quite hard getting home afterwards. Um, and uh, I've seen this conference just grow and grow over the last uh, 11, 12 years. And uh, what a, an absolute pleasure it is uh, to be a part of it. So why is an old cow farmer bothered with beavers? Okay, my village flooded. Uh, flooded twice in 2012 and only flooded again in 2013. Now, I, I've for a long time thought that what happens beyond my farm boundary um, is quite often related to what I do within my farm boundary and no more so than with uh, with rainfall and with, with uh, very, very heavy rain. Um, we've over the years developed really quite good soils here and we're well placed uh, with woodland uh, that can intercept a lot of the um, surface flow going towards the river. But we felt we could do a lot more. And we had a lot of prescriptions for the Environment Agency, but no budget whatever to bring those about, either from the Environment Agency or indeed from our own, own resources. But it became all the things that uh, the EA prescribed the beavers could do for us for free in their own time. So a little bit of a spoiler alert there, they are bloody handy. Um, and they bring great increases in biodiversity and for us with our diversified setup here on the farm um, more interest from our customers too so uh, i'm not going to say any more about it now i'd just like to hand over straight to lucy who is going to tell us about how she sees climate panning out over uh, the, the forthcoming decades of this century uh, which are going to be absolutely critical for us thank you lucy thanks very much chris so my name is Lucy Isaacson. I studied climate and behavioural change science and sometimes it's difficult to take in the enormity of the problems ahead. So I've got some slides now to show you. We can't be certain what weather you will experience until we know if we're all going to cut our emissions. I'm going to share future weather projections for several emission scenarios. So for that to make sense, we will also look at your opportunity to change those scenarios and ways to live and work with them based on past stories, 
current advice and projections. This is the slide that contains the things we've all seen before. Temperature will go up. All areas are projected to be warmer, more so in summer than in winter. Hot summers are expected to become more common. And within 50 years, they'll show increases of between, between four and seven degrees if we don't cut our emissions, but I'm sure you will. Now, some people like graphs, some don't. There's a story with this slide. On this day, I was sitting next to Lord John Krebs, former chair of the Adaptation Subcommittee of the Climate Change Committee, hearing about the new climate change risk assessment for the UK for the first time next to the Thames. Midway, a heat wave was declared in London and we were all given strict advice, water bottles, and it was really hard work getting to Paddington Station to get home. At exactly the same time as London getting baked, 300 miles away, just south of home, Falmouth flooded twice. Now, in 2016, we were lucky enough to have Daniel Johns, former head of the Adaptation Climate Change Committee, and he presented in my hometown this key slide that our local authorities acted on the next day, changing policy to allow for the 500% increase in frequency of heavy rainfall in the most extreme scenario. Now, you can only change that by cutting carbon and getting resilient. Here is an example also where I live. After the Cover Act 2017 storm, the most intense storm we have ever seen, as well as the data suggesting future increases in the intensity of heavy summer rainfall events, all models project a decrease in soil moisture at the same time. This is tarmac. Consider the rest of the catchment. Avoiding this could attract funding for preventing flood damage. So perhaps you can be innovative about this. At a conference I attended three years ago, the head of Thames Water, an engineer, spent his whole time allocation saying he was worried about heat and people suffering the heat and if there was enough water for them. This graph shows in orange the water need and the blue what they have, not enough. He explained they'd costed out transporting an iceberg from the north to London to melt and use. You can see there's a line at 2045, 25 years from now, my 10 year old will be 35 years old. So where will her food be coming from? In your case, how will you manage the increasing irrigation demands? Will your crop survive the heat this engineer is so worried about? To know future weather, we're going to talk about modelling for a moment. And I'll start with saying, what climate change scenario do you want? The UK Climate Projection 2018 is a climate analysis tool in addition to data itself to inform our government's third climate change risk assessment. You remember we talked about it in the first few slides. All projections are probabilistic. Several plausible pathways of future climate derived from an ensemble of Met Office model runs, indicating the range of uncertainty in our knowledge of the climate system and natural variability. To know, sorry, just go back one. To know future weather, we have to understand how it is affected by emissions, Brexit, population, knowledge, and of course, valuing your local farmer. For example, when we take in socioeconomic factors such as that, Professor Paula Harrison found in this blue dashed line increases in arable land because the social economic pathway prediction here, SSP one and three, assume food imports decrease. So we need to grow more. SSP one is the sustainable trade pathway. SSP three represents barriers to trade. Four and five are de decreases, going down with more food imported, so less arable, or the decline in population, which will have a strong influence on the land system. So this is about meeting demand and 
can the food be produced under the climate change scenarios? And all these factors are very important in climate change risk management. As Mark Carney, the ex-Bank of England governor, said recently, firms that align their business models to the transition to a net zero world will be rewarded handsomely. Those that fail to adapt will cease to exist. So let's have a look at heat. We need to stress when we talk about two degrees Celsius climate change, there are an enormous number of climates that fit in that category. These show the mean temperature difference in regional response to a global warming of four degrees. The Environment Agency have said plan for the full extent of four degrees and consider the competition for water. So in the case of holding the water, perhaps leaky dam building or beavers who create these pools. So when you have a dry spell, you can draw from it. So let's have a look at flooding. Now, this is one of my favourite slides of the lot, really. It term, in terms of you realising the gravity of what we have to deal with and why environmental land management schemes are really important for you. Here is the River Severn. You can just see the blue line at the end is where we have data. And our understanding of recent flooding is restricted to this period of time. But look, the record goes back as far as 1750 BC, showing big flood events, much bigger than any time up to this data set that goes up to 2014. You cannot extrapolate recent short data sets for future planning because it does not pick up these enormous events. And extreme floods are not unprecedented. You can see from Benito et al here, Spain, Czech Republic, South France, Germany, Italy and Poland. We are very interested also in compound events, when two things happen at the same time, perhaps a storm surge, when you get a very low pressure and a river flooding at the same time as sea levels being very high. We tend to look at individual events, but not together. This shows the projected change of compound flooding return events between now and the end of the century. The compound flooding will increase in red, particularly along western British coasts, northern France, and east and south coasts of the North Sea. But here is a great example of climate sensitive crop moving through the northern hemisphere, presenting an opportunity, but with it comes risks. So this wonderful project, Vinescapes UK, and you can see who has done all the hard work is a great example to use because when you plant vines, you are considering the average growing season temperature most suited for the grape type for its production over the next 30 years. I totally recommend the webinar that goes with these slides. By having a closer look at the last 100 years, the Australian Journal of Grape and Wine Research found six of the warmest growing seasons in red and have been since 2005, but also note the blue shocks to the system. We are seeing fewer frosts, but during the 11th to 15th May bud burst last year, we have seen some of the coldest frosts seen here in purple in 40 years. Some vineyards reported as much as 80% damage at the time. So just to push the finer point of the value of research in your area, this research provided tailored advice and information that they are publishing soon, and I would suggest following their work. Furthermore, Dr. Caitlin Douglas from King's College London is interested in talking to you to see how satellite data can be used to support regenerative approaches. So please do get in touch if you would like contact details for any of these items. So three nature-based solutions to what you have heard today. I hope you can focus on adaptation, consider how you will slow the, your flow and store water for now. We're lucky to have the Natural Capital Committee here, shows natural flood management measures, in this case trees, to slow the flow in the blue line, to avoid flooding in nearby downstream cities and towns. So it's about public money can pay for these public services to reduce the travel time through your catchment, slowing the flow. There is hope. The UK Treasury has published the National Infrastructure Strategy, 
aimed at providing investors with clarity over the government's plans. There are significant net zero commitments all over the world. The brilliant Climate Change Committee six carbon budget has a section that makes clear land can remove CO2 from the atmosphere, which makes it unique among sectors in the greenhouse gas inventory. Plus, hopefully, COP26 in November. A lot of good things to look forward to that will really help. So in summary, heavier rainfall, stronger storms, unable to predict how much or where, to be fair. Hotter summers, more droughts, rare but harsher frosts, and to consider much drier summers and much wetter winters. But I would say the key points of the last two, understand the risks and opportunities well, act now. Help ensure the pathway that we're going to be on has the least impact, and you can only do that if you cut your emissions. So please let your takeaway message be, you can tell others how you feed them, you prevent floods as you regulate water flow, you enhance local biodiversity, you protect your soil so you, you can grow their food, you hold carbon in the ground and make climate change easier in your catchments if you respond now. Here are the 10 things we can all do easily, done by many. Please get in touch if you want a copy or the artwork or any info from today at all. Good luck. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Th thanks, Lucy, that was brilliant. Um, and uh, I, I, every time I see this presentation, I just see more things which I hadn't noticed before. Um, and for anyone out there who wants to get in touch with Lucy, uh, uh, please do. She is a mine of information uh, about what's going on with, with climate and projections at the moment. Thank you very much. OK, so uh, next we've got uh, George uh, from Fobbing Farm. Uh, Farming George, uh, who's going to tell us about his, uh, how he's adapting his farm at the moment. OK, George, thank you very much. Take it away. Uh, thanks very much for that, Chris. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm going to talk about some of the things I'm doing on my farm uh, in an attempt to try and make myself more climate change resilient. Um, if uh, you're on the social medias, I'm at Farming George, so do go and check me out there. Um, I also blog and do lots of bits and pieces like that. Um, so I farm in South Essex. I've been farming for around about eight years or almost, um, and the farm has actually transformed really quite a lot in that time. Um, what I'm trying to do is really change my model that makes it as resilient as it possibly can be with agroecological principles front and centre. And just to be clear as what those agroecological principles are, uh, most simply it essentially means farming with nature, uh, farming in a circular fashion where you convert um, any waste products on the farm, you keep them on the farm and turn them into secondary products that you can then use. And also it talks about bringing the community and society into your farming system. So when I came home, we were really pretty conventional. We were growing kind of three crops, uh, wheat, rape, and peas, and we did extensively run store cattle, so just some steers, uh, some castrated bulls, on some extensive marshland that was not really part of the rest of our farming system. So that's kind of what I was dealing with. Now, since I've come home, um, things really seem to have gotten pretty wet. So I came home in early 2013, um, and it was, you know, talking to my father, 2002 was a wet year. 2012 was a wet year. And then I came home and 2016 was a wet year. 2019 was a wet year. And then we we're dealing with it exactly the same this year, 2020. Um, now, if this is going to be a common occurrence, having wet winters, we need to create a farming system which works around it. So for context, I'm about 30 percent drilled up of my winter crops this year. Um, and I still haven't even used all of last year's seed. So that's obviously a little bit concerning. And the drilling that we did manage to get done this year, we've got a picture in the middle. That's um, my cross lot drill. That's my main drill. Um, bunging up the press wheels on the back, just about getting away with seeding some, but not very much wheat. Um, and it actually meant uh, that this year necessitated us going out and buying a really simple time drill. That's the Simtech drill on the left hand side. Um, in an attempt to, to get the wheat in the ground, it was actually really nice conditions when we did it. It had been wet. They dried out nicely went in really, really well at the beginning of December. 
and then had about 70 mil of rain in three weeks, uh, which is obviously absolutely fantastic to get a crop growing. So having um, been monitoring the crop, I've stopped monitoring it now because it'll be what it'll be. And I don't want to distress myself by looking at it. But of course, I mean, Lucy was alluding to this. It's not just wet winters we're dealing with. It's droughts as well. Um, and we have had some tremendous ones since I've been back on the farm. Um, you know, the number of times we have cracking on our, our soils that I can literally put my arm all the way down into. Um, and we're on really heavy land. So despite being on heavy land, we're actually still getting issues with drought in the summer. Um, for context, we're on around about 590 mil of rain every year. So quite simply, this doesn't really feel like a resilient system to me. Um, you know, just growing arable crop, uh, annual arable crops. Um, I have introduced the likes of buckwheat, which is a very drought tolerant crop. But the market is really tricky on some of these more niche crops that I'm trying to build up. So it's not necessarily the way you can go. So something really needed to change. Uh, I needed to diversify my cropping and away from kind of that annual cropping where I'm limited to a certain time of year. So given that the, the diversification into buckwheat, hemp, lentils that I've done wasn't enough, what was next on the agenda? So that was when I introduced Herbal Lays. Um, 2018 was the first one that we, we uh, put in, uh, and Herbal Lays are fantastic. They're around about 25, 26 species on the whole, I think. This is a mix of legumes, grasses, uh, various broadleaves, and, um, of course, herbs. Um, and I like to pop in a few annual crops as well. So I'll pop in crimson and Persian clover for a little bit of extra variety and also because they're really pretty. Um, and I love these herbal lays because the ecology that comes on when you put a herbal lay in is just absolutely amazing. I've still got flowers now in January. Um, there's a crimson clover still on flower. There's yarrow, which is this lovely pinky purple one in the middle. Often it's actually white, but uh, sometimes you get this pinky purple variation. Um, and in terms of some of the ecology, this is a beautiful butterfly that I pictured uh, on my herbal lay. Apparently it's really common, but I don't care because it's also really pretty. So I've included it here. But of course, if you're going to bring perennial lays into your system, which are going to be great for kind of being drought tolerant because they're deep rooting and they should also, because they're well established, they should deal with these wet winters. But I need a mower for them. And I'm not a really big fan of wearing metal and burning diesel if I don't have to. And I also wasn't really feeling like I was diverse enough. And as I said before, we had store cattle on our rough marshes. They weren't part of my farming system. So back in November, we got hold of these beauties. These are red poles, polled as in they don't have horns naturally, which is good because it means I can give them a hug. And these are some of the gentlest lawnmowers you can possibly imagine. Uh, now, these red poles are a heritage local breed and most importantly, they're dual purpose. So they're both beef and dairy. And the one on the right there, uh, number 101 that I'm having a, my selfie with is Miss Milky Daisy. Uh, prize for anyone who knows the, the reason for that name. Um, and I bought in-calf heifers and cows due to calve in this spring um, with the idea that I'm going to spend this year researching um, researching dairies and then hopefully next year I will start milking them. But um, of course, things never go quite to plan. And we had a little bit of a surprise at the end of 2020. Uh, this is Iris, um, my lovely red pole calf. Uh, she's a bit lonely at the moment. She hasn't got any friends to play with, which is a bit of a shame. And also, obviously, been, it's been really wet. And it's been really cold. Perfect time for carving. That's why I wanted spring carvers. Um, I've only also got the ear tags sorted just. They arrived in the post the other day. Um, and I'm really dreading having to ear tag her, um, partly because she looks so cute without them and partly because she's also gotten really strong now. So I think it's going to be harder. But I want to interject here. Every time you hear people talking about the changes they've made to their farming systems, often it sounds quite easy. Um, it's not been easy. Uh, we bought uh, 11 cows. I'm actually buying a lot more this spring. Um, and at least two of them have had something called neosporosis, which is a dog vectored uh, virus or condition uh, and has caused two abortions. So um, those two cows are now useless as well. So that's obviously a bit of a shame. And uh, the system I'm actually trying to set up, even more of a shame since I lost um, those couple of, uh, of animals from my system, is the fact I'm trying to set up a calf at foot system. So super high welfare. Now, one of the things I like to do uh, on the farm is I like to kind of have a little bit of a sit um, and look at, uh, analyze what's working really well, see kind of what nature does on its own. 
um, and see if I can take anything from that to, to try and work out what I can do better and what's not working quite so well. So the past harvest, harvest 2020, arable yields were down on my farm between 20 and 30 percent. So I uh, had a nice easy time on corn cart, wasn't particularly rushed. And uh, one day I stopped, parked the tractor up uh, next to this absolutely abundant hedgerow. And I was looking at this hedgerow thinking, right, so this is bursting with fruit. So the hedgerow fruit is up and the arable cropping is down. How can I leverage that idea to make my farming more resilient? So I think you all know what's going to come from here. Uh, this is when, of course, you get to thinking about the introduction of trees. Now, I've gone pretty all out there with my agroforestry scheme. Um, now, it has actually been in the works for five years. That's when I first kind of came across the term and I knew I had to do it. And this is the first of many agroforestry schemes on my farm. It's a little bit different to a lot of people's. Um, I've got wild margins down the edges of the field. That's a way to kind of interconnect my farm and make sure that, that the wildlife has a way of getting to every single spot on my farm. Um, and it really keeps ecology front and center uh, in, in my thought process. But I've also thought an awful lot about climate change in my planting system. Um, and as well as that, I've been thinking about pollution. So this is noise pollution, vehicular pollution and visual pollution, because I need to be grazing every single on my uh, single field on my farm. And this is obviously right. Well, this field happens to be right next to the high road, quite a busy road. And I need to buffer the noise and the pollution that happens there from my livestock. But yeah, in terms of climate change, um, I didn't just include boring trees. Uh, I included some on the more exotic side. This is an apricot tree. Um, I've also got peaches, nectarines, and olives and almonds are due to go in next year, alongside some others. Um, I mentioned my blog earlier, farminggeorge.blogspot.com. Um, this list is actually all on there. I'm even slightly certain I've possibly missed out one or two varieties from this list, but I think you can see diversity is exactly what I've gone for here. Um, I'm trying to make sure that I've got different harvest times, um, that some fruits can stay in the trees, some can't, just to really make sure that I've got as much resilience against weather changes in my system as I possibly can. And then, of course, it moves on to what I'm thinking about now. So the next thing I'm looking at is adding more water to the farm. This rather pretty pond is one that my father put in in, I think, about 1990. There were two he put in, one in one the year before when he... He drained some marshes, ironically, which is something we both agree is something that we don't particularly want to be doing anymore. Um, now, of course, if we're having wet winters and dry summers, we need to mitigate that those water pressures, both the, the lack of and, and the too much of. So we need to store it so that we can use it later. Now, as it happens, we're actually at the bottom of the water system, by which I mean we're actually next to the estuary of the Thames. So storing water on my farm doesn't actually prevent flooding for anyone else. But it is going to be super useful for me. Those fruit and nut trees are really going to benefit from having irrigation on them in the future if we're going to have these tremendously dry summers. And I don't obviously want to be using mains water from that. Um, and also what's really cool about this is that as soon as you start putting water on the farm, Maybe we can enable market gardening as a further diversification and resilience and, of course, bring loads more employment um, and societal benefit to the farm as well. And in terms of like looking at nature and seeing what it does, I, I really had an epiphany this summer about how great water is from an ecological uh, perspective. I was sat literally just where I took this photograph, um, trying to take photos in the summer unsuccessfully of dragonflies either mating or fighting or quite probably both. And it was just mesmerizing. I was there for about half an hour. Um, and the, the new, wa new water that I'm going to create on the farm will be both lined reservoirs um, and also ponds that dry out that will probably kind of take some of the water from those reservoirs as well. And of course, I'm also going to need to plant a load more trees around these water sources as well. Um, and of course, if you really want to sequester carbon with trees, it's not just a matter of growing trees, but it's a matter of growing trees and coppicing them um, such that they can regrow again. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't like doing things that nature can do for me. I'd much rather kind of take the naturalistic approach. So I'm really hoping that maybe it won't necessarily just be humans doing the coppicing in fobbing in the future. Anyway, that has been me. Thanks very much for watching, guys. And um, yeah, if you've got any questions, I'll happily answer them later on. Thank you. Can we go back to Chris?
I'm not very good at comping. Sorry, uh, I can't uh, comp very well. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Here, here we are. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, George. A really interesting. Um, I want to come and have a look. Uh, uh, you are uh, you're welcome anytime. Any time. Get all vaccinated up. Um, yeah. And um, uh, we're going now to Emily Fairfax, all the way over there in sunny California. I hope it's honey, sunny. Um, it's always sunny. <laughs> <laughs> Who is uh, uh, immersed, if I can say that, in, in uh, everything, everything Beaver, um, and is going to tell us a good deal about uh, how how Beavers can actually help a lot with all sorts of things, but um, um, definitely uh, with farming in our crazy climate change future. Thank you, Emily. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Chris. So very happy to be here, very happy to talk about the role that beavers uh, are playing in this warming world. Uh, so climate change be damned, they have a role to play and I'm super excited to tell you all about it. So as Lucy talked about earlier, uh, it's getting warmer, like climate is definitely changing. Our global temperatures are increasing every year. We're seeing this baseline creep towards warmer and warmer and warmer as a planet, uh, and that's concerning for a lot of reasons. Now, baseline creep of temperature is something that we've been seeing over the last decades, and we're, you know, we're thinking, okay, how can we slow this down? How can we sort of make this warming stop happening so quickly? But what we don't really have time to think about and to ponder is how to deal with some of the more extreme immediate impacts of this warming. We're seeing incredible flooding happening around the world that just keeps on coming. Maybe we used to have one storm that dumped a lot of rain and now we're seeing two or three or four and the flooding is something that we're just not necessarily prepared to deal with on a global scale. In addition to climate change causing too much rain in a lot of places, it also is causing far too little in many places. And these droughts are only predicted to keep on getting worse as time goes on. And of course, when you have everything drying out and you deprive the landscape of water, those droughts make it extremely likely that we'll start to see the next step, uh, which is our drought progressing into our groundwater system. So if we don't add precipitation into the land, if we don't keep that water coming, not only will we run out of water on the surface, but we'll start to be depleting the water that we have locked up in the soil, in the rocks beneath us. And that water takes a long time to replenish. And so what we really don't want to see is our droughts propagating into the groundwater system. When we are just completely out of water all around, what we then start to see is fires. And it just keeps escalating. We've seen fires out of control. Obviously here in California, where I am, we have some pretty intense fires, but they're not just in California. They are happening all over the world uh, and are just predicted to keep on getting worse like everything else. So this is a pretty grim message, right? Like climate is changing, it's changing on this baseline level, but it's also bringing these really extreme events that we are not as prepared to deal with as we might like. And so what do we do about that? Climate is changing, we have to do something. We can't just sit here. Our future as a species depends on it. So what can we do? There's two sort of strategies that you talk about when you talk about climate change. We have climate mitigation, and this is more of the long-term reduction in emissions. The goal is to slow or st stop that trajectory of warming. Um, this is an exceptionally important to do. We can't keep warming forever, but it doesn't necessarily fix the consequences of climate change that we're dealing with now. Climate has already changed. The globe is already warmer. We're already seeing floods and droughts and fires. And so when we think about these immediate pressing issues, we need to be thinking about climate adaptation as well. And climate adaptation is both long and short term actions that are designed to minimize the damage that we're seeing from climate change that's already occurring. This isn't necessarily going to slow or stop the curve of climate change. It could, depending on what the design is. Um, but what's really important is that it is it is 100 percent towards protecting lives and infrastructure that is being threatened today by climate change today. So in addition to these climate mitigation efforts that Lucy talked about, you know, we do need to slow down with climate change. We need to curb these emissions. We also need to figure out how to deal with the consequences that are happening right now. We need engineers for that. So a lot of people have already thought about ways to deal with climate change. 
We have very uh, robust engineering for dealing with floods. We have all sorts of levees and dams and flow devices. Uh, we have reservoirs that we store that water in to hopefully be able to access it during these long periods of drought. Although as we're starting to see, reservoirs do run dry if droughts run long enough. Uh, and we are dumping a lot of money into fire prevention. Uh, millions and millions of dollars in California, I believe it's billions of dollars get dumped into fire prevention. Um, we're, we gotta deal with it. We don't have a choice. We have to spend this money, right? We have to do all these things. We need these engineers. And this can be kind of an intimidating thing to think about. This is expensive, this is time consuming, this is difficult. Um, but what about nature's engineers, right? We're not the only engineers on this planet. There's also beavers. And beavers have been engineering the landscape a whole lot longer than we have. In fact, beavers have been building their dams and working hard engineering for millions of years, whereas humans have only been doing it on the order of tens of thousands of years. So what can nature's engineers do for us in the face of climate change? It's not a new concept. They are certainly being talked about in the news as a way to sort of fight fires and save us from you know, impending droughts and floods and everything like that. Uh, and how exactly do they do it? You know, they dam it. It's these beaver dams. We've seen the news articles, we've seen the press, and what are beavers doing? The same thing they've been doing for their whole entire existence. They build dams. And so these dams that you can see here in this side of the image, this is just a large wooden structure, it's very leaky, that creates a pond in the upstream area. The beavers live in this thing that's called a lodge over here. It's basically a big mound of sticks that they've chewed out some little rooms in. Uh, and then from this pond, they dig these channels out into the landscape. They're basically like little canals that fill with water so that they can reach more wood and reach more trees. And I don't know how many of you have seen a beaver in person, uh, but beavers on land are very, very awkward. They are round creatures. They're not very agile, easy pickings for any predators you have. Uh, but once they're in the water, they're very slick, they're very svelte, they're kind of like otters. And so when they dig these channels, they're not doing it with irrigation or spreading water out in mind necessarily. They're doing it to make little water highways so that they can move through the landscape more easily. But the consequence of all this activity of this dam building, this tree chewing, this canal digging, this pond filling, is they've taken the water and they have slowed it, they have stored it, and they have spread it throughout the landscape. And these are three really critical functions for buffering these climate extremes. That slowing of the water, that storing of the water, that spreading of the water, whether you're talking about too much water or too little water happening with climate change, these three things can help us deal with that. So you might be thinking, okay, well, but do beavers belong here? Should there even be beavers in my landscape? There are two species of beaver. There's the Eurasian beaver and there's the North American beaver, and they have a pretty large native range. So the Eurasian beaver is native to a, a lot of Europe and good swaths of Asia. And the North American beaver is native to essentially everywhere from Northern Mexico all the way up into the Arctic Circle. Beavers have been in these landscapes for millions of years. They were trapped uh, nearly to extinction on both uh, parts of the world, maybe uh, between the 1300s and 1700s, depending on sort of where you're at. Um, and they, their population crashed. So we essentially lost beavers for a long time in a lot of parts of the world. But thanks to conservation, thanks to rewilding, beavers are coming back. Uh, and as they come back, they're coming back into this world that suddenly has a lot of people in it that didn't have people where they were before. Um, so part of thinking about beavers in the context of climate change is thinking about, okay, what do they do? And then how can I coexist with them in a productive way where you know, my life, my livelihood is not threatened and neither is the beavers. So climate is changing and maybe we should start asking what can beavers do about it instead of what can we do about it? One thing that beavers can do is they can dampen out flood waves. So there's a lot of emerging research showing that when you have a large rain event, when you have a huge storm, or even if you just have a consistent amount of too much rain, even if it's just a drizzle, if that drizzle goes on day after day after day after day, you're gonna have too much water and you're gonna get a flood. But beaver ponds are able to take that flood water, take those flood waves and slow it, store it and spread it. The mechanism behind this 
uh, as George alluded to, involves both the actual water storage capacity of these reservoirs, but then also their uh, tree cutting and tree encouraging behavior. So to make that point more clear, I'm going to show you a stream that does not have beavers on it in this side. So we've got the stream running through the landscape. We've got some vegetation around the edges. Not a huge amount, but a decent amount. Uh, and then we have a landscape that has beavers. And so the beavers have built their dam. There's this large pond that's formed. And then these little canals going out into the landscape. And one of the things that beavers do when they create this dam pond canal complex is that they encourage wetland development all around them. So this vegetated area actually gets quite larger around the beaver dams. So we've got this stream, no beavers, and then we have a portion of it that's got some beavers on it. What happens when we have a flood wave come? Well, that flood wave starts coming on in, and as it progresses through our stream without beavers, it can cause a lot of physical damage. It can cause a lot of erosion. It can really strip through the sediment. It can rip up those plants. When you have a huge amount of water confined to a very small space, it has a lot of power. You get a fast, strong, tall flood wave. Um, and that destructive power, that erosive power, can really reshape these streams in a way that maybe we don't want. But then as that flood wave moves into this beaver pond and this beaver wetland, the first thing it starts to encounter is deeper water. And so deeper water can accommodate that flood wave a lot better. And then in addition to that deeper water, it can spread out in the pond itself and travel out through these canals into the landscape. So you have really strong connection with your floodplain here. And as it moves out these canals, that energy is getting dissipated. That flood wave is getting lessened. And it takes its time doing this. It really slows it down. And so you're creeping this flood wave through that beaver wetland. And by the time it comes out, instead of having that one huge flood wave you had coming in, you've got sort of this little smeared out bump in your water. It's still maybe more water than you would have seen coming down in the first place, but it's so much less destructive. It has a lot less erosive force. And you can see looking at these images now, over where we don't have beavers, we have a lot of erosion, soil loss, scouring. This stream is probably not going to be as stable, not as easy to support cattle or crops or anything like that. But in this beaver dammed area, there's still some little bitty scour points. You know, it's not immune to all damage, but as a whole, the water was slowed, spread and stored. So a lot of that flood wave is now being stored in the soil of the floodplain. It's being stored in the beaver pond. And the research indicates that most beaver dams can accommodate even large flood waves without failing. And so this is an excellent way to slow that water down, keep that water in the landscape for when our next environmental extreme happens, a drought. And so the opposite of having too much water is having too little water. But luckily the research again indicates that beavers can help with this. So when they've stored all this excess water during these wet periods, that can come in handy when you have a drought. So again, let's think about a stream without beavers, except this time I want you to think about it looking down into the soil. And so we've got the stream here in the middle, we've got those plants, their roots are creeping down into the soil. During droughts, the water table drops. So our groundwater level goes down. We've got that groundwater down here. And then if you've still got some water in your stream, it will be putting some water into the ground around it, uh, usually, but not a whole lot. Then we have our stream with beavers a lot wider pond area and all these little canals are like little irrigation canals, like actual human built irrigation canals through the landscape. They're routing that water from the pond way, way, way further out from the pond, just in these little dugout areas. And so you have a lot of water in there. Now, if we have precipitation, so if it's rainy, it doesn't really matter if we're in the stream without beavers or the stream with beavers because all the plants have water. They're fine. They're happy. Everybody's got their roots going through some water. But as soon as you move into drought conditions, you take away that precipitation, what you start to see is that vegetation starts to wilt or it starts to senesce. If it can't access that stream water and it can't reach the groundwater, it doesn't have water. It's going to dry up. But when we're over here in this beaver dammed area, we've stored a lot of water. Look at how much more water was stored in that soil during the wet period. These little canals are still pumping water out into the landscape as long as there's water in these ponds. Maybe you get a little bit of wilting on the fringes, but the area that stays green is much larger in these beaver complexes. And that's huge, right? Cows need grass, sheep need grass. I'm not a farmer, but I think a lot of animals need grass. 
And if these beavers are keeping that grass green, that's really important. And what I did in one of my studies is I looked in a landscape that had irrigated alfalfa, so like actually people farming alfalfa, uh, a stream that had a lot of beavers on it, and then sections of stream where there were no beavers, and then the hill slopes, which are completely disconnected from that stream water system. And so our alfalfa is in green, and you can see every year it's being irrigated. So we get this nice arc. So the higher this value is on the left, NDVI, which is your plant greenness, the healthier your plants are. You expect it to arc every year, peaks in the summer when we have the most sunlight, drops off in the shoulder seasons. And if we look at our beaver area, it's also following that arc, right? It's doing pretty good. It looks like the alfalfa, but a little bit lower, which makes sense. It's not alfalfa, it's a riparian zone. But then in our non-beaver area and our hill slopes, they just plummet these first three years. And in this last year, they try to arc and then they plummet. And these first three years were droughts. And then this last year was normal. And I do put normal in quotes because this is from a very dry land site. So it doesn't have a lot of rain in general. But what you should take away from this is that these beaver dammed areas, they are acting very similarly from a plant health perspective to irrigated cropland. So the beavers are in essence, irrigating the landscape. When you don't have beavers, you don't see that effect. You see that more wilted effect that I had in the previous slide. And this is really important, keeping these plants green to prepare us for our next environmental disaster, which is fires. But luckily, beavers are here to help with that too. So very recent research, uh, including some of my own, has shown that beavers can create refugia during fire. They can create patches of the landscape that don't burn. So if we come back to this model that we were looking at earlier, We've got these drought conditions happening down here where there's lots of wilted vegetation where we don't have beavers. And then in the beaver area, it's pretty green. Think about trying to start a campfire. You wouldn't start a campfire with wet leaves. It doesn't make sense. You would start it with dry leaves. And so that is exactly how fire physics actually happen in the real world. When you have some sort of an ignition event, whether that is a campfire or a lightning strike or downed power line or whatever, what have you, uh, it's going to look for dry vegetation to burn. That's what's easiest to burn. It is just physics. It's energetically easier to burn dry stuff than wet stuff. And so what you see then is in fire conditions, all of this dried out vegetation starts burning. Uh, but in these beaver dammed areas, you don't have as much dry stuff. It's a lot wetter. Water doesn't burn or it shouldn't. Uh, and so this function that the beavers are playing is really important because they've created large patches of the landscape that are not going to burn. And some of these wildfires spread very quickly. And so if you're thinking, you know, where am I going to take my animals? Where am I going to preserve my plants? Where is the biodiversity going to stay when my landscape is burning? Uh, the answer might be, it would be around beaver ponds. And I've seen this happen. Uh, this is a photograph from the Manter fire in California in 2000. Here we have a section of Creek that did not have any beavers on it. And then over here, we have an active beaver dam right here. This was a massive fire. So you can see that the soil has actually been scorched here. Um, it has burned this tree absolutely to the top. And as it approached this beaver pond area, you can see these fringes, they got a little burned, but then it's green and there's water and the dam is fine. And what you're seeing right here is that this beaver pond prevented this patch of the landscape from burning because it had slowed water, it had stored that water and it had spread that water out in essence, creating this very buffered patch of the landscape. Uh, and in my study, what I saw is that in general, the areas that had beavers burned about three times less than the areas that did not have beavers. And so if you want to create more fire resilient landscapes, beavers are an excellent way to uh, support that goal. So we've seen they're creating and maintaining these resilient landscapes, right? They're helping with floods, they're helping with droughts, they're helping with fires. That's not all they help with. Uh, a recent paper that came out was looking at all of the ecosystem services provided by beavers. We see them moderating these extreme events in here with uh, floods and droughts, but they also sequester greenhouse gases. They purify water. They provide water supply. There's a great video, uh, if you want to see it later, just email me, of a, a firefighting helicopter coming in and putting the bucket down in a beaver pond and scooping water to go fight fire from it. It's pretty remarkable. Um, they provide biodiversity, there's nutrient cycling, there's just an enormous amount of value to these beavers. And if you are super into beavers, just seeing this should be enough to convince you. But if you're not, 
Um, we can also put some dollar signs on that. And so this study figured that for every hectare, uh, which is 0 0.01 square kilometers, I believe, uh, the value of a beaver at sequestering greenhouse gases is $75 per hectare. Their value in terms of the water supply they create is 77 US dollars per hectare. Their water purification, 108 per hectare. Moderation of these extreme events, 124 per hectare. Habitat biodiversity, habitat and biodiversity provisioning, 133 per hectare. And then non-consumptive recreation. So I don't know if you have been on like a beaver safari or a beaver wine tour, they're great. Uh, 167 per hectare. So this is a lot of dollars and this is per year. So these beavers are out there doing all of this per year. And so some take home messages that I want you to think about after this talk is that when it comes to water, the most important thing is that beavers are slowing it, spreading it and storing it. Those three functions are the key for floods, they're the key for droughts, and they're the key for fires. When beavers go into the landscape, they build dams, they cut trees, and they can transform even very degraded streams into these thriving wetlands that perform all those ecosystem functions. Now you might be thinking, okay, I don't want everything flooded, or maybe I don't want all my trees chewed. It'd be very sad if Georgia's apricot tree got chewed, right? That's a great tree. Um, but that's okay, because even though beavers are an outstanding engineer, humans are also outstanding engineers. We've thought about ways to deal with some of this non lethally You can wrap your trees in chicken wire. You can paint them with paint that has sand in it. The beavers don't like that, so they won't chew on it. Uh, if you've got too much flooding, you can install various flow devices. Uh, one of them is called beaver deceiver. And you can sort of control the pond levels secretly while the beaver thinks it's controlling the pond level. Beaver dams can function in a lot of ways that help buffer these climate extremes. So floods and droughts and fires, they're all right up beaver's alleys. They work for free. That's huge. I was a human engineer for a while before I became a professor. Uh, and engineers are not free, uh, except nature's engineer is. So beavers are out there working for free. They just want some sticks and to be left alone. And they provide you with this huge monetary value, uh, which is from that paper that I just talked about on the last slide. So conserving beavers, based on all those ecosystem services, based on the things that they're doing to our landscape, this supports both climate mitigation by sinking out those greenhouse gases, but then also climate adaptation by buffering these extreme events. And more and more scientific research is coming out every year that shows all these different roles that beavers can play in a changing climate. And it's great. So if you're sitting there thinking right now, like, okay, so what do I do? You should, if you have a parcel of land and you've got a stream, Start thinking, would a beaver fit in here? Does a beaver belong in this landscape? If you're in the native habitat range of beaver, the answer is probably yes. Uh, not every landscape can support beavers today. There are things that make it very challenging for them, but many can that don't have beavers yet. So ask yourself, could I have a beaver? And if you think you want a beaver, maybe start reaching out to some of these organizations that are working on rewilding and working on conserving beavers uh, around the globe. And of course, if you have any questions about beavers themselves, feel free to ask me. I could talk about beavers all day. I absolutely love them. Uh, I have my website up here, emilyfairfaxscience.com, or shoot me an email at emily.fairfax at csuci.edu. Uh, and thanks for listening, and I will pass it back over to Chris. Thank, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, an absolute tour de force. Um, brilliant. Now, um, I've got one more slide I wanted to show here. Um, let's just see if I can make this work. Okay, so we've had beavers here on this farm for three and a half years now, uh, and how have they helped with impacts? Okay, first off, flood peaks on average 40% lower uh, than they were before. We had water spare to irrigate when we had that really bad drought in 2018. It's been a brilliant draw for uh, um, customers to our very diversified business. And the beavers are incredibly entrepreneurial. They create jobs for a whole host of other wildlife. And, uh, you know, for example, we've seen eight new species of uh, beavers, uh, sorry, of, of uh, birds turn up on the site since they've been here. Um, as well as lots of other things as well. So really good. So what I'd just like to end with is if anyone out there it wants to know more, please contact me. Chris at beavertrust.org will get through. 
and um, we can take things from there. Anyway, I'd very much like to uh, uh, see if we have any questions. I've got some here which have come through. And um, before we have to zoom out, um, just like to uh, 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 go through as many of these as we can quickly. Um, okay, there was one, first one up was actually about the climate change. Uh, um, for you, Lucy, can you answer that from Sean? Yes, Sean asks, are we moving fast enough? Um, and when will the policy change and how can we make it change? Um, I put up a picture in the slide. Um, you can contact me to get the artwork for it, but we've got these 10 pledges and they're about empowering people to make change, making change themselves at home so that they know. But the fourth pledge is actually to pledge to contact your MP or wherever you are in the world to contact a leader and your friends to, to make the pledges too, to actually do the carbon cutting actions too, but that will affect policy and affect how you actually ask. But unless we do that, because you'll find, um, I'm not sure where you are, Sean, but particularly in the UK, a lot of our MPs are bombarded with online um, petitions. And while these are brilliant and they've been fantastic, um, they don't have the same effect as writing a letter or meeting your MP and actually asking. And I think it's really crucial that we try to move away from apathy and to to kindly approach it and, and ask a leader about making the change. But first of all, we do have to look at ourselves. I'll just add that it's very easy for some people to think that they haven't done the few simple steps, but actually when you do them, you experience them, you tell others and you're ever encouraging others to do them too. So hopefully that helps. But if you wanted to contact me, Lucy, L-U-C-I at climatevision.co.uk, I'll send anyone the artwork and the link all free. Thanks, Thank Lucy. You. Now, I guess this is probably a good time for us to all uh, click on the Zoom link and head across there as our hour is now very nearly up. Um, so is everyone ready to do that? George, yeah, Lucy, great. Um, I, I guess now is the time then. <laughs>